Shalom and welcome to another Case for the Messiah. Today I'm here with Dr. Golan Broshi. My name is Dr. Seth Postel and we actually have something very special today. Today we're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Oh. And wow. you know for us as believers, many believers, it just seems so clear that this passage is about the pierced Messiah. Especially because it's quoted in the New Testament, correct, right? Correct, correct. But we're going to see today that there are some really strong objections to the Messianic interpretation of this passage. Okay. So we're going to go through them and we're going to uh, provide evidence for a Messianic reading. Amen. So what does the what does the verse actually say? Okay, so let's just read it, okay? Mm. So I'm going to be quoting from the New American Standard Version. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced mm. and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Mm. And so the question whether this is messianic or not depends on what? <laughs> depends who you ask and depends which Messiah you're talking about, right? So in Judaism, you're saying that there are two different Messiahs? In, in some rabbinic Judaism circles, there's two Messiahs. I see. Son of David and son of Joseph. And of course, son of Joseph has to come before and die. Okay, yeah. he comes before the Messiah, before Messiah okay. son of David. Okay, so let's look at it. So first of all, we actually have the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. And what is, does the New Testament argue that Zechariah 12.10 is Messianic? <laughs> Sure, and you can read the script, you can read the verse from John 19, right? So just to save time, I just want us to look at the last verse at John chapter 19 verse 37 mm. and again another scripture says they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Uh, this is John recording the crucifixion scene and so he argues that this passage is or was fulfilled in John chapter 19. Yeah, and actually in Revelation, it gets really interesting. Yeah, in Revelation, basically there's actually a, a merger of a quotation both from Daniel and from Zechariah. Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And so the New Testament obviously, obviously. interprets Zechariah 12 uh, verse 10 messianically. So this is what this is what the New Testament says. What does the Talmud say about Zechariah 12? Yeah, okay. So if we're looking at traditional Jewish interpretation, they they actually argue that this passage is also about a, a messianic a passage. A messiah, <laughs> a messiah, okay? Notice what they say in Sukkah 52a, yeah. which is from the, the Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud tractate Sukkah 52a. One said that this eulogy is for Messiah ben Yosef, mm. or the Messiah son of Joseph, who was killed in the war of Gog from the land of Magog prior to the ultimate redemption with the coming of the Messiah, son of David. Okay, so before the Messiah, son of David, the Messiah, son of Joseph, will come and die in the, in the, in the final war. Correct. So they're not actually denying that this is messianic. They're just simply saying that this is not the Messiah, son of David, and certainly not Jesus. Okay, so what are the main objections that we want to tackle in this podcast. Well, there, there, actually, what's special about this podcast is there are a lot of objections, and we really wanted to take all of the objections seriously, because there are several. Uh, we counted five. Uh, there may be more, okay, but we counted five that, main ones. that we felt that were worth uh, interacting with because mm. they were the best. And again, let's just make it clear to our viewers that we're always trying to be as fair as possible with the objections to our interpretation. In other words, we want to present what the other interpreters say, those that are against what we're saying. And not only do we want to present what they're saying fairly, sometimes we even uh, strengthen or add to their yeah. arguments because we believe that's fair. And then afterwards we interact with them. And so today there are five, five yeah. objections. So let's go to the first. What's the first objection against the messianic interpretation of Zechariah 12, 10? Well, often as often context mm. the argument is that if you actually look at zechariah chapter 12 uh, the context is actually about a battle in the last days right and so this passage is not referring to somebody that was pierced two thousand years ago but but a person who dies in this last battle mm. so it's 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 not it's not it didn't happen it will happen in the future, somebody is going to die in the future. Correct, in other words, and we can look at it. So let's just read verses two through three of chapter okay. 12. 
Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And then, uh, as I, we move on to verses 10 and 11, mm-hmm. so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, okay, the cow, yep. and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Rimon mm-hmm. in the plain of Megiddo. It's really interesting that the word here for pierced, Dakar, Dakar yeah, right? It's used elsewhere uh, for people that are slain in, in battle. battle. In war. And so, and we, we've given you a couple verses here. For instance, Judges chapter 9, verse 54, for Samuel 31, verse 4, Jeremiah 37, verse 10. And so it would make sense then that this person that is pierced was not pierced 2,000 years ago, but is pierced in the future in the final battle. So let me get it. Let me get this clear. So the objection says somebody is going to die in the future in the battle, and, and Zechariah 12, 10 is talking about this individual. Correct. And so the argument is like much like... You know, if you remember when Yonatan Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, brother, mm-hmm. died uh, trying to rescue the uh, rescuing the people in Entebbe, mm-hmm. right? And so there's this kind of this understanding of this Joseph, of this Messiah son of Joseph, who will come, and in this battle, he'll do something very heroic. He'll die in the battle. It'll cause such a shock among the Jewish nation that they will mourn mm-hmm. over him. And then on that day... Uh, they will be forgiven and the Messiah, son of David, will come and resurrect and raise up this fallen leader. So that's the objection. Correct. Now, what's our response? Well, again, we're always going to go with context, right? Amen. And so what we're going to argue is that you have to look at Zechariah chapter 12, not just in the immediate context, you actually have to put Zechariah 12 in the context of the whole book. The whole book of Zechariah. And so we're going to argue that in the larger context, Zechariah 12, verse 10, refers to the Messiah, son of David, who actually dies for Israel's sin. Yep, and we have a few verses to back it up. Yeah, so um, scholars actually typically divide the book of Zechariah into two halves. Um, there's smaller subdivisions, but Zechariah can be divided into two sections, Zechariah 1 through 8, and Zechariah 9, 9 through 14. 14. And so far, we've not said anything controversial. Scholars are fairly in agreement here. But what we want to do now is tackle the fact that the whole notion of a Davidic Messiah or the Davidic Messiah is an important theme in both halves of the book. Mm-hmm. So in the first half of the book, right, chapters 1 mm-hmm. through 8, uh, in Zechariah 3 verse 8, you have a reference to this Messiah who is called a a tzemach, a sprout, Sprout, a branch. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring in my servant, the sprout. Right? Why is that such an important word? Well, in in fact, let's just read another verse and then I'm going to explain that because we're going to see that this this word sprout is directly tied to God's promise to David. Then they say, 612, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold a man whose name is Sprout or Branch, for he will sprout out from where he is and he will build the temple of the Lord. And so the word Sprout or Branch is used several other times in the Hebrew Bible. And it actually in those places refers to the Davidic Messiah. Now, where does, the, where does that title come from? It comes from 2 Samuel chapter 23, mm-hmm. verse 5, where David says of God's promise to his house that God would lehatzmiach, yep. he would make it sprout right. up. And so by using that verb to refer to the promise, the prophets later on identified that verb, they turned it into a noun and as a title for the Messiah. And this is common knowledge. This is not Correct. only messianic in this point. This Correct. Is so we already see that in chapter three and in chapter six, there's a reference to the Davidic Messiah mm-hmm. in the book. By the way, no reference to any kind of Messiah son of Joseph here. Yep. Okay, only a Davidic Messiah in the first half of the book. Yep. So what about the second half of the book? The second half of the book once again, and that's going to be even, even more crucial uh, if we're going to talk about immediate context, 
to identifying this pierced one in chapter 12. And in fact, the book, the second half begins with a very clear reference to the Davidic Messiah. Mm. Notice uh, verses 9, 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Now, this is... According to Hebrew grammar, the fact that there's a pronoun your king means yeah, it's, a, it's king. a known king. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not just talking about any king, it's a king that's known to the reader. Yep. So, which king is known, he'll explain. He is just and endowed with salvation, we'll have more to say about that. Humble, we'll have more to say about mm -hmm. that. And mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Okay? And the word here for fowl of a donkey is ayer. Ben Atonot. Mm -hmm. That's going to become very important in a minute. And he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Now, when you read this in Hebrew, there's an immediate context. That well, you, a link, right? A link. So there's only one other reference in the entire Hebrew Bible to a king, a promised king or royal figure that is going to come on a donkey's colt and on a fowl. Okay, and that comes from Genesis 49, verses 10 a clear and 11. clear messianic prophecy. Not only a clear messianic prophecy, but it's also a prophecy to the house of, to the tribe of Judah. In other words, the Davidic Messiah. The yep. scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the pe peoples. Verse 11, he ties his fowl, iro, his mm -hmm. fowl, to the vine, and his donkey's cult, bni atono, the choice to the choice vine and so the point is and again jewish scholars christian scholars Even rabbinic, scholars, rabbinic yeah. scholars see that this reference to this messiah this king in zechariah 9 9 and 10 coming on this fowl mm -hmm. right is a is an allusion to genesis, genesis 49 so it is clearly the book the second half of zechariah opens with a clear reference to the promised Davidic Messiah. So that's the link to David, to Judah, the house of Judah, the house of David. Correct. Excellent. Absolutely. Okay. Um, here's another thing that's really important. The actual phrase, house of David, only appears, the actual phrase, yes, house yes. of David, only appears in Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 13, 6. And it appears... Six times. Six times. So even though, you know, Ephraim, Joseph hardly gets a heartbeat, right? In the book of Zechariah, in the, in the place where the, 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 the rabbinic missionaries are trying to argue against this being the Messiah, son of David. The rabbinic missionaries or anti-missionaries? Well, I would argue that they're just, you know, they're being missionaries to try to actually dissuade people <laughs> from believing that this can be about Jesus, right? So there's, they're, they're, they're missionaries but as well. But you cannot avoid the mention of David. It's David is, so the clear. house of David is six times. Yep. Zechariah 12, seven refers to the glory of the house of David, which is a description of this exalted house of david but the crazy thing is is when zachariah is writing the house of david was in ashes so, yes okay so why would he talk about the glory of the house of david if not having messianic overtones Looking for the future yeah. and zachariah 12 uh, 8 the house of david is singled out and compared with god and the angel of the lord again the house of david receives a lot of glory in the book of zechariah in a book that was written at the time when the house of David was, was in ashes, mm. okay? Also, in Zechariah chapter 12, the mourning of the house of David is singled out, which is quite odd, right? Mm -hmm. So notice verse 10 again, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look to me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. So the mourning of the house of David is singled out in verse 12. Yep. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself. So obviously there's a zoom in in the house of David. So why is that there? If this is all about the, the, the Messiah son of David, uh, the Messiah son of Joseph, why would there be such a huge focus on, this, on the house of David? The fact, by the way, that mourning in the house of David is singled out strongly suggests that the fallen one, the pierced one, is also from the house, the house of, of David. David. Yeah, right? There has to be a link. Okay. The house of David also is not only singled out for its mourning, but also for its forgiveness that, that's going to receive. 
In that day, chapter 13, verse one, Mm -hmm. a fountain will be opened for the house of David David. and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. Again, this seems like very much a restoration of the house of David. Yeah, somebody is trying to emphasize the house of David here. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) The singling out of the forgiveness for the house of David strongly suggests that Davidic rule is once again established in, in Israel when when Israel receives the Davidic okay, Messiah. Okay, so what about what about mourning on, for, for, for the pierced one? Is he compared okay. to the house of David? Yeah, and so once again, in Zechariah 12, 10, it says that there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning in Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. Megiddo. And again, scholars point out correctly that this is an allusion to Josiah mm. who died in that same valley when he was shot, when he was killed. And what's what's really important here is that it's the mourning for this pierced one is actually compared with the mourning of a fallen Davidic king. Exactly. And so again, all the context strongly suggests that we're dealing with a Davidic king, a Davidic Messiah. Yep. And of course it's this is prophesied after after David already died. So it's not a specific about King David, it's son of David or Correct. somebody from David. Well, we're talking about Zechariah, exactly. right? Which is from the post-exilic yep. time. Now, here's something that's an advantage to knowing Hebrew. I want you to notice something. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, the English versions, I think, uh, the ones that I know of, <laughs> kind of miss something very important here. So, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout and triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just. And the, the New American Standard says, endowed with salvation. The mm. verb here in Hebrew is nosha. And then humble, which in, in Hebrew again is ani, ani, and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So it's worth pointing out that the verb that is translated as endowed with salvation mm-hmm. And we're going to get a little bit technical here. There are, but it's there, really important. It's really important. So there are seven different stems, uh, verbal stems in, in biblical Hebrew. Hebrew. And the stem here is nif'al, okay? And elsewhere, it's typically, uh, it, it's interpreted or translated as a passive. He is saved or rescued. The mm. word means to be saved or rescued, yep. okay? And what's remarkable, the fact that this king is nosha saved or rescued, not endowed with salvation, but saved or rescued, it reminds us quite a bit about the tradition of the suffering of David in the book of Psalms. David is frequently rescued, delivered from suffering affliction, in, suffering in the book of Psalms. Now, let's add to this. The fact that Nosha is used with the adjective ani. Together in the same verse. Okay, the word ani that New American Standard translates as humble, but whenever nosha or the verbal root of rescue, deliver is used with the adjective ani, it almost always refers not to someone who's humble, but to someone who is afflicted, Afflicted, someone who is suffering. Mm -hmm. And so the point is here, the use of the verb saved, Delivered and humble or afflicted suggests that Zechariah 9.9 is actually referring to a suffering Messiah. And a suffering Messiah, son of David. Yeah, even in in modern Hebrew, ani can also mean poor, suffers, you know, not only humble. Correct. Yep. So this suggests, if we're going to go with context, that already in the second half of the book, when the Davidic Messiah is introduced, we already have an allusion to the fact that the Davidic Messiah, like King David in the book of Psalms, is going to suffer terribly before he uh, sits on the throne of David. So it's not surprising that we have support from, from other Jewish sources for a Davidic Messiah which suffers. Specifically in verse 9 of chapter, uh, of, of chapter 9 of Zechariah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting in one uh, rabbinic interpretation, uh, we have, uh, I'll read a, f- a few verses here, a few lines. Another matter, according to Ecclesiastes 9.14, a little city, 
refers to Zion, and a few men in it refers to the six days of Genesis 1, and a great king came into it and surrounded it refers to an unidentified person, and there was found in it a poor man, I right? Mean, yeah. Or an afflicted man. This is the Messiah son of David, mm-hmm. as it is written about him, afflicted and riding Again, upon a, yeah. a donkey, okay? Let's, let's move to the next That's quote. That's from Zohar Chadash. Correct. Now from a Midrash Psikta Rabati or Rabbi, okay. yeah. Okay. Righteous and saved. He is the Messiah who makes righteous judgment upon Israel when they mocked him for sitting in prison. And he is called righteous. Why is he called saved? Because he makes righteous the judgment and says to them, all of you are my sons. Are you not? Because all of you will be saved according to the mercy of the Blessed One, afflicted and riding riding upon a donkey. This is the Messiah. And why is he called afflicted? Ani, yeah. Right? Because he was afflicted all the years he was in prison, and the sinners of Israel mocked him because he was riding upon a donkey. And so, once again, I I think this is a close reading of the text. Yeah, and we have... uh an Israeli professor, Israeli scholar, from what we know, a secular scholar, which connects again the, the affliction and this, this, of course, the suffering, suffering king. Okay. And how does he, what does he say about this, these roots? This is amazing. So this is Yair Zakovich, who's a renowned Israeli scholar, mm-hmm. right, from Hebrew University. He writes this, the principal meaning of the first two nouns taken for the Hebrew root Anna, Anna. right, means suffering and oppression. Afflicted and tortured is the same. Tortured, oppressed, humiliated, whether by others or by himself. Wow. So if let's go with context. Zechariah 9.9 already intimates, already prepares us for a Davidic Messiah who suffers Suffered. and is rejected. And that's a theme that goes all through the Bible, by the way. Correct. Yep. Correct. So again, go back to the context. Yeah. So Zechariah chapter 12 happens to fall between (laughs) two other (laughs) chapters. Naturally, it falls between Zechariah 11 and Zechariah 13. And just, it's really interesting that, you know, the, the, the objectors to the New Testament interpretation, they're urging believers or they're urging Christians and they're urging those who are seekers uh, to look carefully at the context. But let's look carefully at the context. The two framing chapters of Zechariah chapter 12 are crucial. Both chapters refer to shepherds and flocks, Mm -hmm. which is a central theme. God's shepherding, right? The shepherdship over the people of Israel is a crucial, crucial theme. And we see that Israel has a an inclination, a proclivity to go after bad shepherds, shepherds, okay? Now, in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 4 through 14, it speaks about this additional shepherd. There's there's two shepherds here, but one of these shepherds is is not the foolish shepherd. There are two shepherds. Mm -hmm. You've got the foolish shepherd in verses 15 through 17, but verses 4 through 14 presents a shepherd whom God... A point. A godly shepherd. Okay. This shepherd actually refers to the Lord as my God, verse 14. Mm-hmm. He's appointed by God over the flock that has been abused by previous shepherds, verse five, verse 5. Because of the flock's disobedience, God calls this shepherd to turn his flock over to their own devices, verse 9. Mm-hmm. This divinely appointed shepherd, moreover, is ultimately rejected by the flock. Verses 12 12 through 14, 14. watch this. Zechariah 11, verse 10, the rejected shepherd speaks in the divine first person voice when he calls the covenant that God made with Israel, my my covenant. Let me read it. I took my staff favor and cut it in pieces to break the... My covenant, which I made with all the people. What does he think he is? So this shepherd who's rejected speaks in the voice of God, yeah. my covenant. Okay? Again, Zechariah 13. The same theme, the rejected shepherd. A rejected shepherd. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man, 
My associate declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, mm-hmm. and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Again, this is chapter 13, verse 7. And the key Hebrew word again? Well, the word associate. Yeah, God calls amiti. this this shepherd my associate, amiti. And with, with the sole exception of Zechariah, this word always appears or only appears in Leviticus. And it always refers to people who live in close-knit community, deep yep. friendship or association. This shepherd is obviously a close companion of God who speaks as God, chapter 11, and yet has his own identity apart from God. The dual identity of this rejected shepherd in Zechariah 11, who is a close associate of God's in Zechariah 13, sheds critical light on the identity of the pierced one who also speaks as God himself in Zechariah 12, 10. And they will look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for for him. Let's go according to context. Zechariah 12, we're dealing with this same shepherd of chapter 11 and chapter 13, who's rejected. Which talks in the first person as God as and in God. the third person. Exactly. Yes. So what about the priestly role of this Davidic Messiah? Do we oh. see that? This is amazing, Golan. So Zechariah 3 and 6, we go back to those chapters where we're talking about the sprout, the branch mm-hmm. of the Lord, which scholars agree yeah, is that it, this is a Davidic figure a Davidic Messiah, and in both cases, he appears with Joshua the high priest, okay? So the objectors try to connect the mourning over the death of the Messiah, son of Joseph, with Israel's national cleansing. But in Zechariah 3 specifically, also in Zechariah 6, but in Zechariah 3 specifically, Joshua's personal cleansing as a picture for the nation's cleansing is tied directly to the Davidic Messiah. Exactly. Again, Davidic Messiah from the house of David. Zechariah 3, 8 through 9, and Zechariah 13, 1 are speaking about, and we're going to read it in a minute, the same eschatological event, which means that the pierced one in Zechariah 12, 10 must be the sprout. So let me read the verses. Yeah, from Zechariah 3. Listen to this. It's amazing. Here's Zechariah 3, verses 8 and 9. Let's go with context. Who is this one? Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch or the sprout. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua. On one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it. And what's this inscription? Mm -hmm. Declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Remarkably. And, and that's important. One day. In one day. Remarkably in Zechariah 12, 10, when our people look upon him, him whom they've pierced and they start to mourn for him, then it says in Zechariah 13, 1, on that day, on that one day, yep. a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. Golan, the context so strongly favors this pierced one being the Davidic Messiah who dies for the sins of the and people. And takes a, a priestly function. Removes their sin. Exactly. He dies for their sin. Okay, so let's go to the second objection. Which is, what's the second objection? Mourning is an action for someone who dies and not for somebody who resurrected. Okay, so we've heard that. In other words, one of the objections we've heard is that, you know, they're looking on me whom they've pierced and they start to mourn for him. They say, how can they mourn for somebody that is resurrected and comes to save them? It doesn't make any sense. (laughs) It doesn't make any sense, yeah. Yeah. They mourn for somebody who dies, right? Correct. Usually in the Hebrew Bible, when you mourn, you're mourning for somebody who just died, not somebody who who died 2,000 years ago and now suddenly appears resurrected. Mourning is not the proper response. Yep. Okay. And we and, and we, we, we put some examples for that. Yeah, so there are plenty of examples. Yeah. But, but what's our response? So our response is that mourning is also an act of personal and national repentance. It's not just grief for the and, dead. And we see it even in the 12 minor prophets. Again, let's go to context. Interestingly enough, in Jewish tradition, and I think this is correct, that the, the minor prophets is actually a single book. book. So we call it the book of the 12. And so, for instance, in Joel 1, uh, 13... 
Joel says, gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Well, not for the dead, no. right? O ministers of the altar, come spend the night in sackcloth. O ministers of my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. They're being called to, to, to lament in, in, in repentance. Because of their sins, exactly. Joel 2, 12 through 13. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Again, that's a sign of mourning. And even in Zechariah's tale. Yeah, right? now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving yeah. kindness, and relenting in evil of evil. Yeah. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5, we also find people fasting and mourning. Uh, again, the fact that, you know, to say that mourning is an inappropriate response if you see this resurrected Messiah, well, it's a perfectly legitimate response if that's the Messiah that our people has rejected and, mm. and, 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 and considered accursed. Yep, and in the context, it's tied to forgiveness, to Cor the receiving of, of forgiveness, again, in the context of Zechariah, right? Correct, correct. So the mourning, again, in Zechariah 12, 10, they mourn, and in Zechariah 13, verse 1, mm -hmm. they're forgiven for their impurities. So it really seems even Zechariah himself turns, directly ties this mourning, not to the mourning of someone who just died, but the mourning of repentance of an entire nation who needs to be because, forgiven. Because they understand how deep is their sin. Correct. Okay, so what about the, the third objection? Which is, what's the third objection? And that has to do with the New Testament interpretation. <laughs> and, it, and, and of course, the objection says that the New Testament interpretation is a misinterpretation of the original Hebrew text. Yeah, so we often hear this, <laughs> that the New Testament... Um, corrupts the Hebrew Bible, or we'll hear that, you know, that that Christians basically, if they only knew Hebrew, they would know that it's a total twisting, and so... Now, here it gets a little bit technical because of the, uh, the syntax, the right? The grammar, the yeah, grammar. and the grammar and syntax, and so uh, just for the sake of our listeners, we're going to kind of go into a little bit of grammar and syntax here. We'll do our best to keep it, you know, for those of you that don't know Hebrew, we want to keep it as, as simple as possible. So, the word here is et asher. Et asher, two words in, in Hebrew. In chapter 12, verse 10, et asher, it's two words in Hebrew. And the question is, what exactly does that mean? Does it mean concerning whom or whom? Yep. So I've heard this. But what's the difference? If it's concerning whom, why, why is it, yeah. what's the problem? So one of the objections I've heard by, you know, again, by the rabbinic apologists, right? Uh, against the New Testament, mm -hmm. they argue that the, the Christian translations are completely wrong. So it's not that they will look on me whom they have pierced, but they will lament, according to JPS, to me about those who are pierced. Okay, so to me, they will lament to me, God, about somebody else, about those, about somebody else. Exactly. In other words, God is not the pierced one exactly. whom they're mourning for, but they're mourning on behalf of those who have and been pierced. And this stands or fall on two words, uh, et asher. Yes. Yeah. So the rabbis argue that the Christian translations have intentionally, intentionally, and it's it's sad that they say this, intentionally twisted the Hebrew to push their own theological mm. agenda. And in fact, one, uh, one website uh, actually boldly claims, quote, the Hebrew words et asher are not found very often in scripture. Which and we'll, is, check, we'll check it out. Which is not correct. Yeah, we'll but then they out. go on and say, and when they do occur, the phrase is read as concerning whom or concerning that, but never as whom. And yeah. and that's actually false. Yeah. That's, that's so not... So our, our response will yeah. now demonstrate that uh, the New Testament, in fact, or the New Testament interpretation does, in fact, uh, uh, translate the original Hebrew correctly. Correct. Okay. So, the New Testament's interpretation, get at the shell, they, they, they identify it correctly. The Greek translation is yes, correct. So, what's the problem with, with, with the, uh, translating et the shell like the JPS did? So, let's assume for a moment, for the sake of argument, that et the shell means concerning whom or about whom, okay? If we go with that translation, which is a possible translation, yeah. it is possible, but if we go with that translation, then the then there's a real problem with the word dakaru, they pierced. In other yeah. words, the Hebrew reads they pierced as an active verb, Yep. whom they pierced. But now suddenly, if we read it literally, okay, here would be an, a literal translation of what they're proposing. Okay, and they will look to me concerning they pierced. 
Which, of course, doesn't make any it, sense. In right? other words, at this point, if I'm going to go about whom or concerning whom, then suddenly I have a nonsensical text. And so the only way to make this nonsensical is to abuse the Hebrew by making they pierced a passive verb, those who were slain. And then we have a different problem. Exactly. Exactly. So it's... It's again, it's, it's doing textual acrobatics. So, okay, so let, let's look, let's examine the Hebrew and see what does et asher, what does yeah. it really mean? So the claim that the Hebrew words et asher are not found very often in scripture is, is really strange, okay? And that it never means whom is also really strange when it appears many times. And in fact, even in the J, JPS, it appears as whom. In Exodus 33, verse 12, Numbers 22, 6, 33, verse 4, Ezekiel 23, 22, Proverbs 3, 12. In other words, in those passages, it appears not as an, a, a preposition, but as a direct object, okay? Yep. And we have a quote from Numbers. Numbers 33, verse 4, while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom et asher the Lord had struck down among them, the Lord had also executed judgment on their gods, okay? So by reading et asher, right, as the New Testament does, as a direct object mm -hmm. marker, which is often the case, there's no textual acrobatics that are necessary. You can simply take it exactly as it reads, exactly. and they will look to me whom they have pierced. And in that case, whom they have pierced, refers to the me. Exactly, correct. Okay, so there's no issue here. So the here. question is, who is the me? Who is the me talking? So once again, what we find here that is often the case in the book of Zechariah, you have very odd syntax that I think points to, I think, a very high Christology. You can't avoid it. Right? A high, a high regard for the identity of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So notice this odd syntax. They will look to me whom they have pierced and mourned for, him, okay? This reading creates a, a theological challenge. How is it that the divine speaker, okay, is simultaneously me and him? First person and third person. And how is it possible to yeah. pierce God? And so, again, we have to look to the larger context. And so, a, a, a biblical Hebrew scholar, Curtis Byron, mm -hmm. actually points to nine other examples in the book of Zechariah where you have these first person divine pronouns, pronouns that appear in very odd places. And just for the sake of time, we're not going to go through them. Let's, let's yeah, keep going. But it's we're as if man is speaking for God. Okay, look it. Yeah. Okay, Zechariah 11, verse 10. We already pointed out one. Here's the shepherd who says, I took my staff favor and cut it to pieces to break Briti, my, covenant. my covenant, which yeah. I made with all the peoples. Wait a minute. Who's speaking here? Is it the shepherd, or him, God. Yeah. or God? There's a conflation of the two persons here. Okay, so the shepherd speaks of God's covenant with Israel in the first person as if he's God himself, and it happens very unexpec unexpectedly. Okay, yep. the Zechariah 3. Okay, Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. I want you to notice it says, The Lord said to Satan. So, what does the Lord say to Satan? The Lord rebuke you. Wait a minute. The Lord is telling the, the Lord? The Lord says to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. Are there two lords here? Right? Of course not. But it's very common in the Hebrew Bible where, for instance, messenger of the Lord appears, where the messenger, a Lord, the messenger of the Lord, like in the burning bush, has an, a separate identity from God, but then yeah. is identified as God. And, and, and we talked about that in our podcast on the Trinity. Yep. It's very common. So perhaps this conflation between the Lord and the angel of the Lord in Zechariah chapter three, and the conflation of my covenant, the shepherd in chapter 11, helps us to understand the conflation of the divine person with the pierced so one. So the author is doing it on purpose to clear to clarify the the the, the identity the divine identity exactly. of this pierced one who is both messiah and god you know golan also let's look at the whole notion of king the, who is the king who's the king in zechariah so context zechariah 9 through 14 the second half of the book begins with zechariah 9 9 your king is coming right on a donkey yep. Okay, so your king is coming so on a donkey. Who is that king? So who is the king? Well, we find the king coming again in Zechariah 14. And in verse 9, we find out that the king is the Lord. Yep. Right? But then it says of the Lord in verses 3 and 4, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. In that day, his feet. Wait a minute. His feet 
will stand on the Mount of Olives. So the Lord has feet. When does the Lord have feet? How can the Lord stand on the Mount of Olives? So even in the book of Zechariah, you have this divine human king figure. Yeah, king. So it would make perfect sense to conflate. They will look upon me whom they've pierced and mourn for him. Him because Zechariah does it elsewhere in the book. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's go to the fourth objection. And this objection says that the popular Messianic Jewish interpretation contradicts the New Testament itself. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> this is, again, it's really interesting that um, the claim is by the rabbinic apologists that um, Messianic Jews who use this verse to say, or Christians, that one day in the future, yeah. Israel will look upon, you know... They don't carefully read John's quote. John basically, basically, they would argue that John actually says this verse has already been fulfilled in the past, yep. not something that will be fulfilled in the future, okay? So here's, here's what they... Here's what they say. I want you to notice. Yeah, let's read the quote. Yeah, so in John 19, verses 34 through 37, but one of the soldiers pierced. And that's a Roman, a Roman soldier. Correct. And so who, who pierced the Messiah according to this one verse? One soldier. One soldier. And immediately blood came out, and he who has seen it has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you also may believe, for these things came to pass to fu fulfill the scripture. And I'm going to skip to verse 37. Yep. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. And so Zechariah chapter 12, 10 was not, is not going to be fulfilled in the future. It's already happened. It was completely fulfilled. A Roman, the Roman soldiers pierced Jesus. Pierced and looked at him. They looked at him. Yeah. And so to say that this refers to the Jewish people who somehow pierced Jesus and looked at him in the future is a total twisting of what John even says. That's the objection. That's the objection. Now, our response is actually that the popular messianic interpretation is identical to the New Testament's interpretation. Yeah, and so just to, again, this is this objection is actually a shallow interpretation of, of John 19. It, it really is. So notice that um, John, okay, who's supposedly ref reporting the fulfillment of Zechariah 12. So he says, you know, the, the Roman soldier pierces him, one soldier, yep. okay? And then it he quotes, they will look upon him whom they've pierced. But, but he doesn't mention? What doesn't he mention? The morning. The morning. In other words, if this is fulfilled, why doesn't John actually mention the fact that there's a morning that comes immediately after? and forgiveness for the entire Jewish nation, according to Zechariah 13, verse one. Yep, and John also in 1937 is talking about piercing in the third person, right? In the third person, plural. Plural. They and, pierced. Yes. Okay. They, yeah. Correct. And that doesn't make sense with the one soldier. Correct. So there's a very selective interpretation here of John 19. So John, John 19, 37 actually refers to the piercing with the third person plural verb. They have pierced. Mm -hmm. Right, they pierced. Yep. But according to John nineteen thirty four, it was only the Roman. one Roman soldier pierced him. Obviously, John infers by using the plural, plural as more. Now, you might say, well, that plural means it's both soldiers. But the problem with that is in Revelation one seven, he uses the same verb as something that will take place in the future, and he says that right that in the future, those who pierced him. We'll look at Jesus. Is John, John is obviously not claiming in Revelation that and the Revelation Roman, was written by the same John, yeah, of course. That he's not claiming that in Revelation that the Roman soldiers, soldiers who executed Jesus 2,000 years ago will also be the ones no. who see Jesus when he returns, okay? So he said the piercing took place 2,000 years ago. The, the, the lament, the mourning will take place in the future when Correct. Yeshua comes back. Correct, and so once again, the, the rabbinic missionaries um, are, are being very selective in their evidence as well because when they, they kind of come after saying that we, you know, we misunderstood or we're misrepresenting John's interpretation, well, yeah. number one, there's a shallow interpretation of John 19, but number two, they leave out the fact that John quotes the verse in Revelation. Exactly. And Revelation speaks of a future fulfillment of mourning in Zechariah 12, 10 uh, through 14 when Jesus returns, right? Yep. And obviously he's not talking about the Roman soldiers. Notice what he says, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's a yep. quote from Daniel, right? And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, okay? And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Uh, so the question is obviously, or the, it's obvious that John 
sees this as being fulfilled in the future, in the future. just like Messianic Jewish believers are claiming when Yeshua returns. and Christians are claiming. Exactly. So to say, therefore, that the Messianic Jewish interpretation of Zechariah is at odds with the New Testament is proof texting and yeah. cherry picking. So we're talking about a multi-layered fulfillment, in Correct. other words. Correct. And so how can John in 1937 say that Zechariah 12, 10 was fulfilled and that in Revelation 1, 7, that it will be fulfilled. And I think that's just very easy. And mm -hmm. we would just simply argue that uh, there's, it's multi-layer. Jesus was pierced. Jesus was pierced. That already happened 2,000 years ago? That already happened. He was pierced, okay? But one day our people will look upon him and we will mourn for him. Amen, amen. So the final objection says that John intentionally misquoted Zechariah 12, 10. Correct. Now why would they say that? Yes. So, the original Hebrew text says in Zechariah 12, 10, they will look upon me. Singular, yeah. Right? Me, you know, it's a first person, first right? Person, me. Yeah. And John says? Well, John, they would argue, is being very deceitful here because it says, John says they shall look upon him. So, what John is doing is he's, he's doing not exegesis, but extra Jesus, right? <laughs> he's forcing Jesus into a passage, okay? Yeah. So, our response is, of course, that John intentionally interprets Zechariah 12, 10. Correct. And doesn't, of course, misinterprets. He yeah. intentionally interprets it. So, we know this, studying the Hebrew Bible, um, that biblical authors often change texts that they quote from other places in the Bible, not to be mischievous, not to do damage, on, on the contrary. but to yeah. interpret them. Exactly. Here's a classic example. example. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 14 through 16, God's promise to David, I will be a father to, to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the son of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. This passage is quoted again in, in 1 Chronicles 17. And here's what's really important. The change. Well, yeah. let me simply say that Chronicles, we know, is one of the last books of the Hebrew Bible to be written. It was written in the late Persian period, perhaps even in the early Greek period. Mm -hmm. And the writer is writing at a time already when the house of David is in the ashes. It's in the dust. And so notice how he quotes this passage. Mm -hmm. He changes it. Yep. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it away from him who was before you. But I will settle him in my house and my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. He completely removes the line that talks about the house of David being punished. Why? Because it was no longer relevant. It's not relevant the house anymore. of David already pun was punished and therefore this promise can only now and specifically refer to the future so Messiah. So the author, the author took the liberty to interpret it according to the circumstances. He changed the text, but not to do abuse to it. Of course not. He changed the text in order to interpret it. Amen. And this is exactly Amen. what John is doing. When John says they shall look upon him whom they've pierced, right? He's basically identifying the me as the hymn, I'd like to quote from Michael B. Shepard, who, who actually I had the privilege of studying with. He was a, a fellow student with me with John Salehammer. A biblical scholar. A biblical scholar. He's very well known and published. Notice what he says. John's version of the text of John, right? Mm -hmm. John's version of the text essentially collapses the first person pronoun into the third because Jesus the Christ has already been identified as God in the flesh. John is, John is not abusing the text. He's simply interpreting, interpreting it. it. And Making he's being, it clear. He's being consistent not only with his own theology, he's being consistent, we would argue, with Zechariah's theology. And with the enti entire Bible. Correct. Yep. Exactly. So, for summary, okay. let's sum up the, 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 the objections and the responses. So, there were a lot of objections and there are a lot of responses. So, let's make this short, okay? Yeah, the context. The context. The first objection that the context makes it clear this is the objection that this is referring to a Jewish hero, a hero who dies in the last battle, not the Davidic Messiah who dies for the sins yeah, of Israel. But actually, but if we look at the entire book of Zechariah, it anticipates uh, the coming of 
of a Davidic Messiah, not a Messiah son of Joseph. And this pierced Messiah is identified as the rejected shepherd. The He's branch. The, the branch who, who in one day will bring forgiveness to the whole people of Israel. Yeah, what about the second objection that mourning is only for somebody who dies, not for somebody who resurrected? Correct, but we've seen that mourning is often or also used as an act of personal and national repentance, which would be very fitting for the people of Israel in their treatment of, right, the, the shepherd the whom Messiah. they rejected. Yeah. And the third objection had to do with the New Testament interpretation, which... Of course, they will say misinterpreted the original Hebrew text. And we basically argued that this whole notion of et asher, um, it, the New Testament's interpretation, uh, which is in Greek, is an absolute accurate e e interpretation, yep. translation of the original Hebrew. Amen. Now, the, the fourth objection said that the popular Messianic Jewish interpretation it doesn't align with, with the New Testament interpretation. And we've argued that the popular Messianic <laughs> Jewish interpretation is identical. And the New Testament's interpretation are the same. And Golan, we're longing for that day, Amen. by the way. Amen. And the, the, the final uh, objection says that John intentionally misinterpreted or misquoted Zechariah 12.10. Well, no, John intentionally and correctly interprets. interprets. Like the Bible does. Zechariah right? chapter 12, verse 10. Amen, amen. And so we, again, we turn to our viewers and we just want to encourage you to search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And we believe by carefully reading the book of Zechariah and looking at Zechariah in the context of the rest of the Hebrew Bible, we believe that you will see that the New Testament has accurately identified the pierced one as Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward to reach others who need to hear this message? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.